before the, the War of 1812, surveyors came through this whole area and did all of the surveys. Then came the War of 1812, no settlers came, no settlers came. Then um, in 1811, people were settling into Liverpool Township. Columbia Station already had been established and there was a fort there. And during the war, the people in, in Liverpool would sleep there overnight for, their, for safety reasons. And they would lay on the floor, foot to foot, <laughs> head to head. So I can't even, you know, makes you feel lucky about where you are now, what time, what time we are living in. So in Brunswick, ironically, the people who did the survey bought their land in Brunswick. Now they had done all of the, it wasn't still a Medina County yet. It was all part of one big uh, West, Western Reserve uh, section. So, um, so Brunswick came before Medina County. <laughs> and so the, the Freeze, and, and these people still have ancestors here today. So the Freeze, F-R-E-E-S-E, -E -E, Abraham and John, in 18, eight, well, and in 18, by 1817, we had our people meeting in churches, in, in, in homes as churches, and that's in 1817 is when the, the Methodist Church started here in Brunswick. So that's our oldest uh, church, the United Methodist Church on 303 and 42. And so, and shortly thereafter were several other churches that, that came. So religion was very important to people. And by 1819, we already had a one room schoolhouse with a teacher. And in the next couple of years, there were eight one room schoolhouses in Brunswick. So the kids would walk to school, many without shoes um, and back. So when kids come to Heritage Farm to, and they say, oh, I wish I lived in those in way back in those days and so I take them to the back door of the house and way over by the red barn is the hand dug well I told them well you would probably have helped your parents dig that well and now before you walk to school in the morning you have to go back and forth to that well and bring your mom as much water as she needs well maybe we won't be maybe it wasn't <laughs> so much fun to be to live in those days <laughs> living those days was in was hard work no two ways about it. Um, and I, I keep thinking how brave they were. I mean, would you think about like picking up your family, walking for three months in the winter to someplace you've never seen, don't know anything about, don't know if you're going to be able to feed yourself if, you're, if the seeds that you brought with you don't grow in the ground that year. I mean, it had to be so scary, but I, I guess, Back in the day, they were a lot more adventurous people than we are today. <laughs> and they worked hard. They worked very, very hard. So uh, Captain John Stearns, who was one of the very first uh, settlers, and you see plenty of signs about Stearns, S-T-E-A-R-N-S, road named for him. Yeah. He had a very, very large family and a large, large groups of people uh, in his family. They they had houses. All he was. He actually conducted some of the first uh, school classes. He was a Methodist, and he donated uh, the land for the church and for the burying ground. So that's Westview Cemetery. So Westview Cemetery has been there a very long time, and Captain Stearns was there. Um, we have a lot of residents there from Revolutionary War, the the Civil War, War of eighteen twelve. Um, Pretty amazing if you get a chance to go walking through and look at the older uh, headstones it gives you a pretty good sense about the fact that many people died very young. Um, of course, they went through the flu of 1918 and all of that stuff that we're going back through now. Whoever thought it would happen in a you know, <laughs> so I never thought I'd see a pandemic in my lifetime, but. Here we are, <laughs> and so and it wasn't even on my bucket list. So the so in 1818, uh, David Burdan, a, a fairly wealthy man who lived in New York on what is now called Park Avenue, um, bought a piece of land here, and his two sons came. Now David never came, but his sons Abraham and John came to to live here, and uh, John wanted to start a a store, but in 1818, there still were not that many 
people in Brunswick, and it didn't seem logical to start one. He married Pamela Fries, a local girl, and they they then took their family, they, they headed off to Toledo, which was a bigger town because it was on the lake. And, and they uh, started a, 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 what turned out to be a huge department store in the long run. And he, was, he became the first mayor of Toledo. So the first mayor of Toledo ba basically came from here. <laughs> so, so that's pretty cool. His, uh, his ancestors came, um, came in and, and did a tour of, of the house. They had gone by it sometimes, they live in New York and they had gone by, this was a great, great, great granddaughter of John. So she's the, the Toledo branch, but they live in New York. And, and so they actually, in their general store, they made uh, glass jars and it says Burdan on it. I'm still waiting for them to send this one. But, but it actually has their name on it. Would that be so cool to have it in the in the uh, collection? Because we have a whole huge collection of of jars and other containers that they had to use. Then um, some of the things we like to talk about, especially if there's children, are are things that they had they would never suspect that people had to go through. They, I mean, first of all, they. We finally got a dial telephone so I could explain exactly why we call it dial a phone. I, every time I asked that, it it was hysterical. Sometimes, and they don't know anything to do. So, and somebody gave us a crank phone. So we have in the kitchen now, we have a crank telephone, an old wood crank telephone. So um, so we can show them how how far technology has taken us. You know, it's just... Uh, they, they just don't have a clue. And I have to kind of watch now because I'll say, it, it, well, don't you? No, you couldn't remember that. You wouldn't know that what that was. So they, this was all farm. Well, it was all a forest. Okay. I mean, heavily wooded. Um, and so you can imagine they come here. I don't know how they found the place. Well, maybe because the, um, the set, some of the settlers were the people who, who uh, surveyed it. They would know where to come. So maybe having them in town was the way people figured out where they, where they bought their property. Um, and, and they would come, they would immediately have to clear off a space. They wouldn't even think about um, having a house or a shelter right away. They had to get their crops into the ground because if they didn't grow and if there weren't things to hunt, they didn't eat. You know, they would have starved to death. So, I mean, there's just it was a matter of necessity. So one of the very first things they did was start a farm. Um, we assume that on our property, they had a log cabin or some sort of shelter. We think it appears that the barn was built first because you could sleep in the barn with your animals. You couldn't have them come into the house and sleep with you. In 18, about 1850, they built a one room house. So four people, it was um, Abraham, his wife, and two daughters. And uh, the girls and their parents slept, ate, studied, uh, whatever they did, sang, read the Bible, all in one room. And it isn't very large, so when you come, you look. And then it wasn't until 10 years later that they built the kitchen on the front. So that's the door you come in when you come in from the ramp. The kitchen is the 1860s part of the house. And I always look at the floorboards. The, the first floorboards are thick, like this wide. And then they get a little narrower. And then in 1899, they get really narrow, like mod, more, more like modern floors. And they found varnish because that's the only place that there's varnish. So two, the two-story part of the house at the Historical Society was built in 1899. All the whole time, this was a farm. And even in, in 1945, when the last private owners, there were only four private owners of that of the property. Um, and the city is now the fifth. Um, Mary and Pete Groening came from Germany. He was a cobbler, a shoemaker. Um, he died in 1963. She lived to 1995 and did not drive. So I always hear a lot of stories of, from old timers who come by and say, oh, I used to pick up Mary and we would go to the, we would go play cards. She loved to play cards, but she was also very 
adamantly against growth around her property. And when a developer came and knocked on her door, she'd face them off with a broom. <laughs> <laughs> so in her honor, we have an, a, a, a mannequin, a 1920s mannequin dressed and we call her Scary Mary. <laughs> and <laughs> she looks very real. We have people walk in the house and say hello until it dawns on them that it's not real. She has a wax face, glass eyes like a doll does and real hair, real human hair. So um, their idea of mannequin was make it as lifelike as possible, I guess. Um, it Brunswick, when I got here, so I came in 1958, was still basically a farmland until the GI Bill came into effect. We still had two schools. Edwards Middle School is, was now Edwards Middle School and the Visentainer Building that were just torn down. When I got here, those were the only two schools. They weren't full. <laughs> um, they, they housed every child that went to school in, in Brunswick. But uh, Visentainer was started before the war, but was not completed till after the war because materials all went to the war effort. So after 1945, December 7th, 1945, everything went to the war effort. So that was delayed till basically after the Korean War. So um, that so only part of that building was used, and that was just the that was an elementary school basically. So they, they went from grades no no kindergarten one through eight, and then nine through twelve in the other building. <laughs> then somebody discovered inexpensive land and a GI Bill. And there was a huge demand for housing as, as Ken came back from the war. And I think it was, I can't remember, not Zarembo, one, one of those builders didn't even have his own car to drive. Elmer Benjamin, if you know where Benjamin Farms is, the Benjamin family uh, owned that property for six generations. And <laughs> He used to call him and, and he would go pick him up and come out to, to survey the land so that they could start the housing. And that was the Laurel uh, Sleepy Hollow area. So mm -hmm. by 1962 or 63, we had so many people moving to Brunswick that we were building a new elementary school every year. So started with, I, I think we, we, we believe Grafton Road or Kidder Elementary was the first separate school built. Then Applewood, mostly Crestview. Uh, then, and then there was a little gap and it has started to grow again because there was the energy shortage back in the seventies and it, you know, until about 80. Then Hickory Ridge. And then the last two were built almost simultaneously, Memorial first and then Huntington. So those are our, our elementary schools. They were filling up that fast Jim Hayes, who you all may know, was the not only went to school in Brunswick at Grafton, started at Grafton Road, and uh, was a, a, a graduate of our high school, was a teacher, a coach, the principal of the high school, and finally superintendent. So he remembers his his grade levels had to go half days for a while. There were so many children that and not, and not enough room. They were using the old town hall for younger kids. They were using um, the, the basement of the Methodist church for other special classes. It, it was just amazing to watch. It, and, and the tax laws were different then. Once we passed a levy and, we, oh, okay. and, and people started moving in and so the, the, the amount collected from each house would go down. All, all we did was raise it back up to that level. We never had to pass a separate another levy. So, and of course the legislators screwed that all up. So that it, <laughs> you know, when, when back in the fifties and sixties, we were not a city school district. We were all part of the county schools. So although Mr. Towsley was the superintendent of Brunswick schools, he was under the auspices of the Medina County schools and Mr. White was huh. the, the 
overall superintendent. And for many years, there was, you know, people trying to urge him to, we need to separate, we need to be, you know, <laughs> um, we need to be our own thing. And so finally, uh, that happened. And, and uh, ironically, Mr. Towsley um, had a family who had a, a, not a very good history as far as health is concerned. He was the very first superintendent to choose, to ask for an assistant superintendent. And when he, he brought in a young man, Mr. Veering, and he, Mr. Tosley died of a heart attack not long after. So wow. he, he must have had some inkling that that was going to happen, you know. And then Mr. Tosley's son was the head of maintenance for a long time. And um, and the top, they're, top, they're still Towsleys all over, <laughs> all over Brunswick, all over the area. And uh, Mrs. Towsley, uh, Cecil's wife, taught Latin at the high school. Um, a lot of people remembered her for that. They're just, you know, it, I think back to when I first stepped into Brunswick, for some reason, it just felt like home. There were no stores. There was Zimmerman's General Store on the corner of 303 and 42. The post office is where the, the brick building on the other side of the street is across from the, the church. Um, when I started in the newspaper in 1959, I started as a typist on the, and we had the first offset newspaper in Ohio. Emily Oravec and I were the typists and we were in the basement of the post office and there was no toilet. So you had to come up, go to the, the gas station next door to go to the bathroom. And it was such an old building and they had a tin ceiling. And if we stopped typing, you could hear mice or rats tripping across the, the, the metal. So we typed a lot, <laughs> you know, we typed really fast. So, and, and you know, you, it really was a place where you could almost say you knew everybody. Um, some newcomers would say, well, that's just a click. And I said, well, yeah, because they do all of the work, <laughs> you know? And so for once it started to, to grow and it was a township. So it was a five mile, five square miles, five miles each way, which is 25 square miles, right? You math people. <laughs> so all one township, the um, newcomers had, had a, uh, the Civic Corporation, that's what it was, the Brunswick Civic Corporation, they tried over and over and over to go from a township government to a city, to a, a, a village. After the fourth try, and believe me, it was a very heated discussion. I learned really fast not to open your mouth about how you felt about it. So after the fourth try, and I think that was 1959, it passed. And immediately the people in Brunswick Hills seceded from Brunswick, a, a section, almost exactly the same section that is now Brunswick Hills Township. But then two other areas seceded. And so it, at one time, I think it was 162 borders. So it looked like a big old patchwork quilt. You call the police, you didn't know where you lived probably. The city police wouldn't come to the hills, the hills. Yeah, yeah, it was it was just pretty strange. <laughs> and so it made a lot of bad publicity in the big Cleveland newspapers, you know. And so, um, and that's the only time they would come out to cover Brunswick was when there was some terrible thing that they thought coming, uh, going on. And um, after the 1960s, we were a village then, after the census of 1960, we had enough people that it, it transferred from city to uh, some village to city. So there were like, elections for those new people every single year. <laughs> so, but John Dinda, who was a township trustee and wasn't really happy about being in the city, I don't think, uh, became the first mayor that, that of the village. And then when we became a city, then somebody else, Carl Miller was elected and then, and so on. Um, probably the most well-known of our mayors was uh, Alan Wolf, the Wolf development, Wolf Drive, um, Hickory, you live there, <laughs> Hickory Ridge, that, that area. Um, and then uh, Al died at, 
in office as the mayor. Um, I guess it was, you know, he just had a heart attack and died. And so, so that we've had some characters back in the day, like the very first meeting I covered, and I'm not a trained journalist. Um, my, my boss, Neil Gow from Medina owned the paper and he asked, uh, do you know anybody who could uh, write about meetings? And he says, why don't you try? It's $10 for me, $10 was a huge amount to go to a meeting. I was making 95 cents an hour, guys. So that's history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that first meeting went from seven o'clock to midnight. And then I, okay. And then I had to uh, type it and take it to Medina. <laughs> it took me till three in the morning. And so I, and, and by that time, our, the leader post had gone from, that was the name of the newspaper, went from a weekly to a daily. And so I had to do that. And when I, when the, when Neil called, I called Neil, I said, was it okay? He says, oh yeah. And we're dividing up into five, five uh, parts because there's enough for five days worth of news. <laughs> and I never realized I should just you know, make small stories. <laughs> I just type small as one story to begin with. So it was a big, it was a great learning experience. Um, meanwhile, the, the, the township uh, started to thrive, but then when city water came, so in 1965, it was the Brunswick Bicent or Sesquicentennial. The same year we had city water come to Brunswick. We had I-71, open from 303 South, not North. They started at the South and went North. Took a couple more years to go all the way to Cleveland. Um, we had the tornado of um, Palm Sunday and the bicentennial, during which celebration we had a civil war reenactment at Benjamin Farms on 130th Street and the Ku Klux Klan with a burning cross at Foskett Road in Pearl. <laughs> and every time you, so, I mean, tensions were a little high about that. And so um, at the center of town, and there weren't a lot of roads yet in Brunswick, right? So you had to go through a 342 Laurel, Sleepy Hollow, you know, just the major roads. And the sheriff's department <laughs> set up a, set up a, a post in the middle of 303 and 42, and they had to search your car every time you went through. So if you were like me and you were going back and forth a bit, every single time you had to, and they found some exciting weapons, I guess, while they were there. It was, it was, an inter it was very, a very interesting time. We had the biggest parade ever though, it was at like three hours. Uh, because, you know, people came from all over the state to, well, and we did more of that stuff back then. There wasn't, you know, a computer or a TV screen or, or that kind of thing to, uh, to, to, to uh, distract you <laughs> anymore. So anyway, I wanted to talk about um, some of the funny things that we never think about. So in that, in that uh, sesquicentennial, oops, I don't know if you can see that or not. It's a little button and it says, the Brunswick Sesquicentennial, and it was called Brothers of the Brush. Now, if a man wanted to shave, he had to buy one of these. And if he wasn't wearing it and you caught him shaved, he'd be arrested and put into a kangaroo court. <laughs> so every Saturday we had kangaroo court at Brunswick Plaza, which was the first uh, plaza opened in Brunswick. Mind you, during this whole time, this was still basically a farm community. So people wonder why, I mean, we came before Medina, right? Why didn't we have a square? And because we had great farmland. When Moses Sherman came to Brunswick, he and his brother Cornelius, they were pretty wealthy people. Again, I think from New York. And uh, they came first, uh, they came by boat on Lake Erie's and they were met by developers from Cleveland. I don't know how, much, how developed it could be in 1817, but you know, it was bigger than here. And they showed them land. They didn't like it because it was too sandy. They couldn't grow potatoes there. So what happened was they came here, they had uh, the first brick homes in Brunswick at the corner of 303 and um, uh, 
130th Street, and there's now a, a, a little uh, office complex called Sherman's Corners there, because that to us was all of Sherman's Corners. There was a horse trough in the middle of the road, so you could, you know, have water for your horses as you went by. There, all of the, the churches still had hitching posts. So, I mean, we were still, and did you know Brunswick had a circle at the center of 303 and 42? So when I got here in 1958, you could still see the circle. So the bank had not been built yet. There was nothing on the corner yet at, um, uh, of, um, the, so that's the Northeast corner where Walmart and all that is, or Walgreens is now. So you could still see that circle. Uh, you could see it in front of the brick building that, it, that was the post office and just partially in front of Zimmerman's store, which was on the corner where the church uh, parking and, and lot and things are now. So, um, and, and they did look one time, um, Sid Welch, who was the development director or something at one time, about maybe we should put a roundabout again, you know? And it, it, was, it was just impractical because of the way the, the, the town is laid out now. But when automobiles came in to being, the people who would drive their automobiles, instead of going around the turn, would land straight in the middle of that park that was in the center. Of, <laughs> they had to keep, you know, they'd knock down the fence and then they had to get towed out. And so the, it was the AAA or the state highway department said, no, you, you're going to have to take that circle out of there. And so they did. But it's a shame because it really was a pretty cool thing, you know. It had a little like little fence post with chains going all around. Had a gazebo. Uh, there were two bands in Brunswick at the time: the men's band and the women's band. No, nothing was ever uh, co-ed in those days. Um, there were no school bands at the time. There was there was music taught in the schools, but not no no. Um, no real like band music. And then, uh, th and that's something that when we open, I, I don't know if you all know that the, we built a new building uh, at the farms. Still owe a lot of money to get it finished, but it's getting there. Anyway, that will house all of the artifact from 200 years of schools in Brunswick. So um, the first school band director basically who didn't belong to the county band thing. So the, at the, when we were part of the county, they had a music teacher who would go around to all the different places. But so now Mr. Sago came and, and, and Mr. Towsley always told me this story, George Towsley. He said when his dad came home and he says, oh, I just hired the third baseman from Cincinnati. And of course they're all thinking he was a baseball player and he picked, he was playing bass clarinet in the Cincinnati Symphony. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought that was the greatest thing. So he had a, a sense of humor. <laughs> he also grew, I think daffodils or lilies and he was like an avid gardener. And so he, these people are so interesting. You know, our, our history is so interesting. Um, the streets that you see all have names of you wonder what where the names came. They came from the settlers, Keller and Hannah. Keller on one side, Hannah on the other. Miner Drive, a whole miner family lived on that, that street. In fact, Handy Miner, one of the descendants, um, sold me our sold us our first house in Brunswick. Um, it uh, it's just it's just really fun. The same thing with the schools, how the schools were named, and the schools were all named for people eventually. Um, so uh this is cool too. The, the new middle school, uh, the band, one of the instrumental music directors, uh, Gary Allen, has a, um, had got a, a, a $500 grant and had a composer write a song in honor of the new school. And he's also doing a video, kind of like a historical thing, looking at the schools. And he's going to, it's going to debut on YouTube in, in June. So I'm excited because I've been sitting in listening to some of the the uh, interviews. It's been really, really, and he played the music for us, and it's wonderful. He, it starts out with just one instrument, 
So that's Edwards. The second instrument is Visentainer. And then when it wrote, then it's Willits. <laughs> and then it's all done together in a big symphonic sound. So very cool, very cool. Um, the, here's, oh, whoop, you see that? There's mm -hmm. Nancy Visentainer, the widow of the man for whom Visentainer Middle School was named, commissioned uh, a famous uh, Cleveland photographer, Jim Patachek, to do photographs of the three middle schools. They're much larger than this, obviously, and they she's donating them to the schools to be hung in the hall so that they can still remember who the three different uh, uh, schools were named for in that, in that part of our history. And then she asked him to make us, the Historical Society, a collage like this, and, and we're selling them to help us build the, the building. Um, and we're also selling, ugh. so you wanna buy a brick? <laughs> <laughs> so look at the brick. This is a brick from Edwards Middle School. Look how big the holes are. And they're kind of fluted on the, on the edges. Um, and it's very, very heavy. And then compare that with the brick from Visentainer. Oh, well, this is one of the, the solid bricks. But the ones from Visentainer have six or eight holes and they're very much smaller. Um, and and um, so we've got uh, bricks from each of the schools that, that again, we're you know, selling to raise money for the thing. And, and we decided we would come up with a certificate of authenticity. So when your grandchildren look in your closet after you're gone and they're going, what the heck is a brick doing here? <laughs> you, they will know <laughs> this is a brick from the school that they went to. <laughs> um, and, and, but I, the, the things that we're used to for advertising, I said, I love these, these are tin. And, and this is how they'd go into a, the grocery store and the tin would be there and they'd say, oh, that looks really good. You know, there was going to help you book. That's upside down. Isn't it? <laughs> so this Walter Schmidt of Valley City donated these um, and they're all, uh, there's a whole bunch of them. It's really cool. I mean, that's what's fun about being part of the Historical Society. I don't know if you all know where it is. 4163 Laurel Road. So it's between Pearl and Substation. It's a 32 acre farm still. So the museum is a farmhouse. You will see things that were used in that house in, and around Brunswick. Nothing was in the house when the city bought it. The owners, the, 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 there was a nephew who um, was the executor of the estate. They didn't have any children. All the rest of their relatives were in Germany. So they had a, a house sale, they sold everything. But when they heard it was going to be for the historical society, they bought the stove back. So it's an enameled stove that uh, burns coal and wood. Um, and on the side, the, the missing part is, is a tank that was on the side and, and mom would have the water in that tank all day, get, staying warm from the fire from the, from the stove. Um, but we have all of the canning jars, all of the, I mean, you name it, we have it. Some things I would never, you know, there, there's something hanging on the wall that I thought might be an early uh, fire extinguisher, actually a sausage stuffer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and believe me, we have a wide array of, of, of uh, sausage stuffers. A gentleman uh, called last year and he says, I have a handmade sausage stuffer that my that he he remembers his grandparents and his uh dad and his and uncle making sausage in this every single year it's like they made it out of a tube that's this big and this long it's heavy <laughs> um all the, you know just just things people donated every single thing that's in that in that house and believe me, there's a lot of things, which is why we needed the new building. <laughs> because uh, not only did we get a lot of artifacts from the schools that came down, but at the same time, the, the congregational church, the first Christian church um, had to be sold. There were only eight members left. We have the 1852 bell that hung in the bell tower. 
So, and oh my God, it's so cool. <laughs> it's, it's unlike what you would think a bell would look like, thin, you know, bronze or something. It's It's gotta be four inches thick. You put your hand underneath it and it's like that. And, and it says, uh, you know, uh, cast in Troy, New York, 1852. And I see how do we put this. If you look at an old picture, friends, what you see a white church, a church with a steeple near the near the Westview Cemetery. That was the Methodist Church. Well, when Mr. Stearns gave them the land at the corner of 303 and 42, they sold that church to the to the disciples of Christ, which then broke off into two parts, uh, Church of Christ and First Christian. They moved that to the corner where Walgreens is. And that's where it was when I got here. And then the Marathon gas station bought the property from them. And that's when they built the, 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 the uh, church next to Towsley Elementary School in 1961. The bell started out in, in, the, in that church and we have it. Um, it also has a commemorative stone that was uh, put into the, the uh, structure of their bell tower that we've preserved, uh, and it's in honor of the Gibbs family. Um, and Farnham Gibbs was the first ordained minister, and uh, he has family members still here <laughs> to this day. And there were actually two separate Gibbs families that weren't really related um, in Brunswick for a long time, very active. Then, um, and they gave us, I mean, a billion things. Does anybody need uh, name tags? They must have must have had 5,000 5, name tags. <laughs> so, <laughs> and 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 it was such a shame to see them have to. But once we can get the school stuff into the new building, we can change one of the rooms in the in, in the house over for for. Uh, the church artifacts, because, you know, we had a lot of churches here, Brunswick, where we always talk now about a pizza uh, parlor in every corner. When I got here, it was, there was a gas station on every corner, and then it became a drugstore on every corner. But in between that was a church on every corner. Every small vacant building in Brunswick had a church in it. Some of them are still here. Some of them didn't make it. <laughs> But um, so church was a very important part of Brunswick. Um, and oh my gosh, you have to see the Bibles. They gave us a Bible that's this thick from the 1830s. It's sitting in, in, in our parlor right now. It, you know, they're just so neat to see all this stuff. Um, to see a deed go from the, an original settler to his son, a deed transfer, and actually be able to read his name on, you know, I'm going, oh my gosh. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and his house still stands. Um, Norman Shidsey, who came from New York, walked all the way here to find out that he'd been cheated out of his money. Walked all the way back to where, you know, the Northeast, uh, saved his money, got married, came back with his wife and they the, the house on 130th street still stands near Laurel Road it it i think it's between Laurel and um Sleepy Hollow and 2 years ago the big pine tree in the front came down and that pine tree was planted on the day that Lincoln was assassinated so <laughs> i mean you think about you know the stories that those people could tell Mrs. Jitsey was known as um, a medicine woman. She knew how to take care of ill people. There were no doctors at the time. One night there was a knock on her door and uh, two men came and they said their friend was dying uh, just over the border in Hinckley. And they, this Mrs. Carpenter lived on Carpenter, uh, Mrs. she lived on Carpenter Road, what is now South Carpenter Road. Uh, so she grabbed her bags, tucked her kids into bed barefoot ran all the way to with these guys to her to the patient's house he was he had an infection she sent them out to kill polecats you know what a polecat is it's a skunk <laughs> they shot skinned them she took the skins and put them over the wounds and by morning the infection was gone now you tell me who came up with that. <laughs> who, who would think of that? 
Ralph Strong once told me he was, Ralph Strong had Longview Farms, which for many years was at eggs and turkeys and, and things where architectural justice is now. Well, Ralph was a very, very, very big member, important member of the community. He was a relative of the Strongs from Strongsville. His, his uh, uh, family came here. He was the second generation in this area. He said he was at walk to school one day and he got his ear bitten by a dog. And the kids love to hear this. What do you think his mother used on his ear to get it to heal it? Cow manure. Oh. Okay, who thought about putting cow poop on a, <laughs> your ear? And have had kids in, in school go, what's manure? We are no longer a farming community, as you can see. So now, once city water came to Brunswick, then um, the requirement to build a development in Brunswick became that you had to have, if you wanted water, you had to rejoin the city. So that's why we're, we're a lot more evened out than we were before. So that, so that Brunswick Hills now is the outer edges um, as it was during the first uh, secession. So we have, we have quite a history, you guys. Um, I, I really hope that everyone will come to visit. We have an auction, an online auction right now that we're raising money. And, and Joyce, you're going to put that up on the screen. It's, uh, um, she has the link to it. And you can come to our Brunswick.com uh, webpage or we're on Facebook or Twitter, but I don't tweet. So <laughs> that's, and so we would love to have you come. Uh, our, our farmer's markets are held on Sundays from 11 to 2, starts this year on January, oh, June, <laughs> June 13th and goes through October. And we're on the, the fall foliage tour this year. We were on it last year and of course they had to cancel it. So, I mean, that's always a really cool thing because we have lots of demonstrations. We have candle making and and uh, one of our docents does la lace making, tatting. Uh, we have our spinner, um, the weaving guild will be there. Um, and, and you get a chance to get some hands on, on things and hopefully by October we'll, we'll be able to do that. In September, um, the middle of September, we have a butterfly release. A year ago, we had, we had kids learn how to tag the butterflies. But this year, because of COVID, we couldn't do anything hands-on, so they they didn't do that. So they pre-tagged them and showed them, you know, and then they the kids got to release the butterflies. It, it's it's very cool. We also didn't have time, didn't have a way to safely hold our annual uh, canine costume contest in October, which is really fun. Um, people go all out with costumes for their dogs. I can tell you. <laughs> It's just, um, we have, we're, we're, because we don't have a farm anymore. Now, although the back of our, the back 25, you know, is being farmed. That, uh, Dave Goodyear from Mist Farms is, hi, Bill, is, uh, is um, raising hay there now. And the community gardens, but from the city are there. Now, they didn't do them last year because they, Everybody in the parks department was on furlough at the time. So this year, I just got noticed they're going to have them again. So if you want to have a garden and you don't have room for it, you just um, go up to rec center, uh, talk to them about it. They, it's, I, if it's the same price as always, it's $35 for 20 by 20 plot of land. Um, if you're a city resident, if you're from out of the city, it's $50. They plow it through and, and cultivate it for the first time. And then you come and put your put your own touches on it and your fence, your whatever. <laughs> and, and that's always fun. I, I love to watch what, what the gardeners do out there. This year, we have a, a group of uh, uh, Girl Scouts, and I think they're from St. Ambrose, um, who uh, who are going to do a garden and give the, give the, pro the produce to the food pan as one of their projects, which I thought is real nice. We have a children's garden, the Soil and Water Conservation District a couple of years ago um, brought uh, the idea to us and they got, we had like 60 volunteers. So we have four different types of gardens 
and you can come and just sit and watch. And, and, and one is a pioneer garden, the way things used to be. So it has squash, beans and uh, corn, which is what the Native Americans taught the early settlers would get them the most for their for their time, you know, because of the, sh the short growing season. And, um, and so, uh, and we have a, it's a sensory garden. Then we also have a butterfly garden that the wild ones, which is a, a nationwide group started. So it's really, it's just, a, it's a fun place to be. You can, it's a city park. So you can come anytime, sit outside. A lot of people come like during their lunch hours and just sit out on the picnic bench and enjoy themselves. It's quiet. <laughs> it's uh most of the time, not on Sundays, but it, uh, you know, Sunday afternoons, but it's quiet most of the time. And, and it just is, it's just really cool. We have deer, of course. I get to watch them bounding across the street. I, I, I get so worried because they bound from our side to the, to the uh, south side of the road because it's wooded over there more, more than it is uh, around us. So I think uh, that's Sam. If you can, uh, when we did that, I, you you were actually sharing your video screen before, but I think there should be a way. So see if you can either get that share back or somehow get your video back on. I mean, it's it's sort of active, but it's not hmm. shared. Um, but anyway, we'll. I guess we could kind of open it up to questions. I um, yeah. When when you were talking about the schools. I know one thing that you guys were trying to do before they they tore the building down was to save the stone doorways from yes, we, from we the arch. Were they you guys did. able to do that? Yes, they did the arch. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, I can. We can still hear you. Yeah, okay. yeah, um, yeah. They were able to save the arch. It's in pieces, of course, because it you know. But they marked it all so that we'll know where it goes. And on the front of the building, you see it has kind of a funky looking um, uh, door at the front of the building. And it's because that they've made a, a, a place for the arch to go. So yeah, and then and then with, with some of the bricks, um, a lot of those bricks, boy, believe me, they, when, they, when they mortared bricks, they really did it back in those days. So there, we had a couple of really large hunks of multiple bricks. We're gonna add that to the front kind of in a decorative thing um, and so uh, so that'll be cool too and then inside it's all I'm, I'm thinking we're going to need to have moving walls like um, like in an office like where you could because um, it's all open uh, we have two of the largest bathrooms you'll ever want to see though I have no idea why they made them this big they're ha both handicapped you right know? Right, that's probably but I said, okay, I'm not wasting that wall space. Whoever goes to those bathrooms is going to have a lot to read. <laughs> so, uh, Dell, I see Dell's on my screen. So that's, I see Dell and then all you little, your little things there. So I don't know what's happening here, but anybody else have a question? Yeah, if you guys raise your hand and then I'll call on you so we don't have too many people. So go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, Okay, yeah. Mr. Dell, go ahead, you first. Sam, what is the story behind the donut shop that's next to uh, Walgreens? Oh, well, that's been there forever. <laughs> I, that's right here. What, what's yeah. going on there? It, it actually was, there were law offices and um, another, uh, like an office building, a converted house that was an office building. And that was there. And then they built this little, it was a convenience store and uh, two other little stores. And then Bill Reiner, who unfortunately is on his final stages of cancer, um, was a a donut chef at someplace in Cleveland and they moved out here and he said, I'm gonna start a donut shop and I'll be darned if he didn't. And it's like 40 years now. And so uh, I think they, it's what 40, 45, whatever they just celebrated. But yeah, it's a now his son has it. And his son, I started a newspaper in 1973 and it was free and we deliver, we mailed it for a while, but then then we got newsboys and uh, Bill Jr., who's now the proprietor of Donut Land, was one of my first carriers when he was in school. <laughs> so, so that's always cool when you can when you can see you can do that. So, and and they've just been wonderful members of the community. They did have a second shop up by the Kmart Plaza for a while, but everybody loves the 
the one that's there. So that's the story as far as I know it. <laughs> and they make donuts every single day. So they're not bought from someplace else and brought in or baked somewhere else. They do it all themselves. All right. Any, any, any other questions? people with questions? Please, I hope you'll come and visit the house. We, we weren't able to open the museum, the farmhouse this year, because it's small and we couldn't distance and we couldn't use sanitizer on most of the stuff because it's some of it's pretty old and pretty sensitive. So, but I'm hoping for this year, I, what I've been doing is like, um, there's a lady who comes and buys uh, she, on, in our online auction. I, I swear she's there once a week for whatever it is. And she, she told me yesterday that I was her only form of entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I she kept, comes once in a while with her children and I said, would your kids like to go through the house and see what we have here? And so she brothers, she had five. <laughs> and so the six of us went through, I mean, we were all masked, we were all, and, and it was kind of fun, you know, to have people there again. We have Carol Foote, who is our uh, excellent docent. We wanted, we're training kids to be uh, tour guides, especially through the uh, through the new building once it once it gets up. Uh, National Hon Junior Honor Society has been really active with us, so kids need five hours of of uh, uh, service volunteer time every month, and that includes the summertime. And so we're one of the few places they can come in the summer, and and uh, do their thing. So yeah, it's it's been a really really great partnership. So and uh, you know we just the city still maintain. I mean. The city owns the whole property. We maintain the buildings. Um, they maintain the grounds. So it, it works out fine because they come with their big mowers and get it done because I don't know how we do it. <laughs> we have a couple of hand push motors on, uh, you know, with the little blades that go this way <laughs> that we used to have years ago. <laughs> I don't think that it worked very good for five acres. <laughs> do Was there any kind of, um... Uh, like an ethnic concentration or did we get waves coming through or what, you know, what primarily were most of the earlier settlers? Well, the earlier settlers were either from England or in, in mostly the German settlers really settled uh, Valley City, the Valley City, Liverpool area that they had a big German population, but we had some, but you know, when, when it started to grow and back in the day when I was a JC and I can't even remember that when that was, Chuck O'Malley was the, the, the mayor. Uh, and we had a meeting, a, a person from Detroit described their riverfront festival and it was a nationality festival. And I said, well, be darned. We have a lot of different nationalities in Brunswick. So I went to the mayor and I said, we should start a, a nationality days. He says, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so we did. It used to be at uh, uh, Laurel, Laurel Square, and uh, I got all the friends I knew who were of different ethnic groups. So we had a lot of Ukrainian people, uh, German, Lebanese. My mom made kibbe and stuffed grape leaves, and um, Polish. Uh, I care, but they all sold their food. You know, it was free admission, sold their food. We had belly dancers, Baj Baja. <laughs> she she was wonderful, and um, and and we also started the the men's uh, beauty pageant. <laughs> Mr. Brunswick was for men over forty, and they had to have a talent. Didn't and they had, but well, see, I, the people were men were complaining. We had the Miss. Medina County pageant, but we didn't have anything for men. So that made one up. That's cool. And uh, they and we had a special prize for the hairiest legs <laughs> and the biggest belly. <laughs> and we had some great talent, but boy, we had some that were really <clears throat> not me, interesting. <laughs> bad joke tellers, you know, bad comedians. We had a professional violinist one year, Earl Carlson, who was a professional drummer in his early years before he went into the funeral business. He was the very first Mr. Brunswick. Oh my he, goodness. He could really play the drums. Um, we had a Drew McClung, who was a city councilman, 
he he did a ventriloquist act with his son as the on his knee as the as the as his ventriloquist dummy. Um, Al Samsel, who uh, just recently passed away, did a square dance all by himself. <laughs> So it, it really was, it was crazy. It was fun, uh, you know, it, uh, and, and people enjoyed it. You know, it was, it was just very simple. Then, um, then that stopped for, for a while. And then uh, when I was a chamber president in 1980 and we still didn't have um, any, not, homecomings were the big things when I, when we first got here, the chamber of commerce had, which was by the way, open only to men. Um, <laughs> when I first got here, homecomings every summer. And it was just a little, like a get together kind of thing. No, no rides, none of that stuff. And it was in front, in the front lawn of Visentator Middle School, which was a parking lot by the time you guys got here. So, um, and which was also the first football field in Brunswick when we had a football team <laughs> with only six men on it, six man football. So, <laughs> So come to the farm, enjoy yourself. I'd be glad to show you around. We have a 1943 tractor. We, if if the um, if we can have our hay ride this year, that's always fun. Uh, there's a one mile traverse around the edges of the farm. It's very bumpy, and, and that's why only young people can ride. <laughs> I say more than once, anyway. Um, it, it just, it's just a very nice place to be. We have a lot of, uh, not some home gardeners. We have a couple of uh, people with very large gardens. And then we have a lot of crafters. And last year, crafters had no place to go. And then of course, uh, at our festivals, we always have the, the line dancers from the recreation center and those wonderful belly dancers from three tents from the Nile. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So hopefully everything, you know, everybody's fingers crossed that everything will be able to go off uh, this summer and fall a lot different than last year. So Sam, thank you so much. Oh, wait, we got a question there. Lori, go ahead. Oh, uh, we're going to wait for her to unmute. I'm sorry. We're waiting for Lori. To, go ahead. She's got a question. A question that I had. I remembered many years ago going to Brunswick Lake Park for different exhibits, um, you know, different events like dog shows and right. whatever. Everybody always got stuck in the mud. <clears throat> but was that a private uh, farm that was owned by somebody before it, you know, became what it is now? Yes, actually, in during the Depression, there was there was just the creek. There was no lake. And um, the man that owned the property was a, a fairly wealthy physician from Cleveland. And he hired the Widmeyers to, to family. He put them up in that house and they built the lake there. And then it eventually was uh, part of the Calfas, K-A-L-F-A-S. Yeah. The time I got here in, in, in early in the fifties, we used to come from other places and, and just go swimming there. Um, yes, it was all privately owned, and then it became a campground, and then it, be, you know, and and still had a swim thing, and um, and it had a go go kart track at one time. So it was yeah, a neat place to come. Um, yeah, there, Sleepy Hollow also had a campground and a and a lake, and that Sleepy Hollow was on the other side of the dam from uh, from Brunswick Lake, and then uh, still on Sleepy Hollow. Uh, Today, to this day, on um, substation at Sleepy Hollow is uh, the campground. Right. So, yeah, we still have one left. Oh, that was neat. Thanks. Enjoyed the uh, presentation a whole lot. Yes. Is there a charge to go through the um, through the house? No, uh -uh. no? We not, you don't. You, you're not charged for admission. You're not charged for no. Okay. That's, we want you to know about the history. We don't, I don't need to pay. You can donate, but that, you know, go to the auction site, bid on something. They, you'd be surprised what people have been giving us to bid on. My vendors from the, one of the vendors volunteered to do the auction, went around and got all of the, the things that are in the auction. And we haven't even gotten through them all since October. We've had, a, had different things up all, all uh, this time. So we're going to go until... You know, it's our only way of making money right now. And so that's what's paying the, the bills. 
um, I adopted the telephone bill. <laughs> Somebody else needs to adopt the electric, I guess. And, and now, of course, with the new building, we've got double the, the cost for electricity and gas. <laughs> so we'll do it. I know we will. It was meant to be. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for uh, this presentation tonight. And yeah, hopefully we'll be able to get the word out to people who maybe are not familiar with it. And, and for those who've only been sort of you know, on the surface familiar with you guys that uh, have, have them come on over to both your actual place and to, like you said, that auction great. site. That's great. Thanks so much great. for having me. Thank, Thank you, you for doing Thanks, this. Man. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Five, six, eight, ten. Lead, Alt plus Q. <laughs> lead, Alt plus end meeting or lead, lead meeting. Lead. This isn't going off. <laughs> um, this is Mrs. Aqua. Do you want to? I think your your mic is unmuted. Do you want to tell me what your first name is? Hello. Uh, I'm glad you got my email for the link. Um, hopefully, I will be able to uh, to get your name. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation.